It's a nice looking plant you got here. stuff so e-collar use well the way to tell especially with a deaf dog there's very little way to communicate boundaries without it right like you have alternative ways to crack dogs like you can get into like squirt bottles and like pet crackers there's like compressed air and stuff like that there's a couple different types of corrections use but this is going to be the most efficient one right so my mentality as far as use of the e-collar like long term in the house is initially right first month the dog is home whatever you know in your guys's case probably the next like three weeks or so um, pretty much anytime you're out with him it should be on right just because there's gonna be plenty of training opportunities that present themselves plenty of boundaries that need to be set right there's plenty of little things in the house that need to be worked through right um, that you just have to be prepared in order to address right so yeah for right now just have it on as much as possible long term right once we've worked through those things which if you're consistent over the next week about like addressing the issues at the window and like anything else in the house you may be seeing you should see that stuff pretty much start to dissipate you know Know, like pretty quickly um, from there we I always use the e collar long term in three scenarios with my dogs so if we're going off leash anywhere from having people come over the house or for going anywhere public outside of the house right and I'm not contingent on needing it in those situations but I always put it on in those situations just in case I run into any scenarios where my dogs blow me off right uh, and because I always use it in those scenarios I rarely run into problems that I actually need it right um, and then from there you use it like a tool right if I start noticing that there's some weird new thing that's happening with my dog. They're getting into something or, or whatever that they don't usually do. I'll start re-implementing the e-collar for a couple of days just throughout the day so that I can address that thing consistently until it goes away. Then I fade it out again in the house. Mm -hmm. So uh, if that answers that question, obviously. As far as the introduction with people and stuff, we'll get into that in a minute here because I want to work on the bed stay a little bit okay. uh, and that kind of will go hand in hand with that. So I'll take the leash from you. Oop, thank you. And you guys can go ahead and have a seat over there. I'm just gonna work them a little bit here. So I'm gonna run them through a couple bed stays. <clears throat> so at this stage, we really shouldn't need the food as much with him in the training process. We're kind of just gonna be giving the commands and just enforcing the commands. So obviously our cues we're giving, you know, our gestures towards the object or obviously into the position, downs, stuff like that. So for the bed one though, it's just a gesture towards the, the object. If he does it, fantastic. If he doesn't do it, I'm just gonna give a tap on the e-collar, then help him into position at that point. Same deal if he were to break command here, I would give a tap on the e-collar, then I would go back and help him back onto that bed. So we've been doing training every, every meal with him and using his cool. food. Should we start doing it without the food too? Up to you. I mean, listen, like I'm not like, you can reward your dog. I have no problem with it. We just want to make sure he's still going to listen if we don't do it, you know? Because um, that's really where it kind of comes into handy. Yeah. <laughs> so so the, the meal training, I'm listening, it's fantastic enrichment for the dog. You know, it helps keep them sharp with commands and stuff. So you could do that as long as you want to do that for. I've got no problem with it, but you don't have to do it as much at this point. He did a really good at the family dinner that What's that? He did really good at the family oh, yeah. dinner Cool. How did you guys handle it? Um, we introduced him, like, instead of bringing them into mm -hmm. Sure. We just went like neutral, like outside. Cool. And just everyone kind of came and stood around. And just mm -hmm. kind of, you know, like we, was, we would give him the command to sit or lay down and mm -hmm. kind of calm down. Mm -hmm. And then once he was like calmer, he would sniff people and pet him. And they took turns giving him treats. Yep. And then he was pretty much. Yeah, so, so you handled that pretty well, right? There, there's nothing terribly wrong about the way that you did it. Um, there's a couple adjustments to make just to make some more clarity behind it. So you did the 100% correct thing by um, 
having him do something first before the interaction. So you said you made him sit and just like chill out for a minute, right? Anytime I'm gonna introduce my dog, especially a dog that's maybe a little bit fearful of people or dogs or whatever it is, to a potential trigger, my first step is can I gain compliance around this thing, right? And you don't have to do it outside, you can do it in the house. I use my bed stay for this in the house with dogs, right? I'll put them on a bed stay, I'll bring the people in, and you know, I expect they're gonna be a little uncomfortable, a little apprehensive, stuff like that, and I just let them chill there. Just focus on this right now, right? I do that until it seems like they're totally settled, until they're totally chill, obviously. Bro, the itchiness. You're just a mess, dude. You're a mess. <clears throat> um, I do that until, it's right there, gave a tap, helping him back on. There we go. I do that until they're totally chill, right? I wanna see them completely settled on that bed. And I should see them in a state of mind where he's no longer really concerned about what they're doing, right? At that point, then I allow like just kind of neutral coexistence, right? So I release him or in your case, like what you did where you kind of had him just hang out and sniff and stuff like that, correct as well, right? Totally fine. But I try to have a little bit of separation as far as in that stage of things, I still instruct my guests, just kind of ignore them, right? Let them sniff you, let them check you out and stuff like that. And just, just let them kind of get comfortable and coexist and stuff like that. From there, I jump into the actual interaction stages of things, right? Which is, you know, if you want to pet them, you can, but I try to make a rule where I don't let people come into their space like this, can that be really intrusive to dogs, right? If you want to pet them, you can kind of gesture them over, right? Or see if he wants to come over to you. And then if he doesn't, you have to respect that, right? And that just means he's not ready for it right now, and that's totally fine. Uh, the treat thing, can go either way, right? Um, my only issue with having guests give my dog treats is sometimes if you have a dog that's really fearful, if you kind of coax them in with the treat, they'll eat the treat and then suddenly it's like, whoa, like I just put myself in a really vulnerable position because I wanted that treat. And now that the treat is gone, I realize, holy shit, this person's right there and I'm uncomfortable with this. You know what I mean? So, so it, it can kind of like, uh, it, it could kind of trick them almost a little bit, you know? So I, I tend to not, not do much with that, you know? Once I know my dog is cool with the people, if you want to have, I mean, at that point it's not a big deal um, because then you're not kind of coaxing them into that position. They're already comfortable with you and then you're just giving them a treat to make it even better, you know? So that's the only thing I would do different. Like I said, you handled it well, uh, just a little bit more structure to those stages with things. And then just keep in mind that each one of those stages, whether it's the neutrality on the bed, the coexistence off of the bed, or the interaction stages of things, they're kind of prerequisites. So I have to see him in a totally calm state of mind on the bed in the house around the guest before I do the neutrality stage. And then I have to see him totally neutral and comfortable with the people while he's free before I move on to the interaction, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Right? And as long as you follow that, you really won't have any issues with it, you know? Um, even just like walking through the sound. Yeah, it's, it's pretty straightforward. The biggest mistake that people make is they just move through the steps too quickly. You know, and they try to start with the interaction side of things before they even gain any control over the dog around the person. And then it's suddenly they freak out, right? And then they have to resort to growling, barking, biting, things like that, you know? <clears throat> and then uh, also understanding that each, t at least for a little bit, until you've generalized this pretty well with new people, each time a new person comes to the house, you have to go through those steps, right? So let's say, whatever, y your aunt comes over and we've done all those steps and he's really good with her and then she comes back two weeks later, I still try to go through those steps again. You know what I mean? At least until I've really checked the box that like he's good with this person, okay. right? And in some cases, like the second time, maybe each step takes you three minutes to accomplish. You know what I mean? It's not like it has to be like the whole time. Maybe it's like, okay, two minutes on the bed, all right, he's chill. Two minutes of him just chilling, all right, he's chill. And then you jump right into the interaction, okay. right? Uh, kids, you were saying kids. Kids, I'm much more slow about with things, right? I have a general principle with my dogs that I, I don't really see a need to have my dogs interacting with a lot of other children. Like, I don't know the context of this kid as far as if this is somebody that's just gonna be around all the time or, okay. So if it's somebody that you're gonna be living with, that's a completely different story. Obviously, we have to be able to get him comfortable with them. Uh, how old is the child? He's three. 
three. Okay, so really young, obviously. So in those stages of things, it really comes down to just mutual boundaries, right? So we have to obviously set boundaries with Connor, just kind of leaving him alone more or less sometimes, right? And like practicing impulse control around the kid. And then we have to have boundaries with the kid of we're also gonna set boundaries where if he's just like laying down somewhere or if he's on his bed or something like that, he has to be left alone, you know? And that's where it just comes down to management. Like obviously when you get into like really young kids, like they can comprehend that obviously, but sometimes you have to do some management of like, some people will be like, oh, well I told them and they keep doing it. And it's like, well, they're three years old, right? Like you kind of have to play the game of, hey, like let's not do this, right? <laughs> so uh, just, just mutual boundaries with that. That's, that's the important part is, you know, kids are weird to dogs, right? In the end of the day, like they, they look different, they act different, they sound different, right? They move faster. Um, so we have to be empathetic to that's gonna be weird to him initially. You gotta really just take your time letting him, you know, get acclimated to that, right? And don't be surprised also. I think a lot of people get really concerned when dogs display discomfort, right? So like in Connor's case, like when he was first here, first week he was here, something like that, you know, every now and then with like a new staff member, something like that, you let out a little growl if he was uncomfortable or this or that. And it's like, a lot of people look at that and they think it's just like the end of the world. Like, oh my God, he's being an aggressive monster. It's like, no, he's just saying he's uncomfortable with what's happening in that moment. And, and that's, that's normal, right? That's dog communication. Now, I'm gonna be aware of it, right? If I start noticing he's growling because he's uncomfortable with something, I'm gonna ask myself, what boundaries do I need to set right now to help him feel more comfortable, right? But I'm not gonna be totally Totally freaked out by it either. You know what I mean? And I'm almost going to expect a little bit initially as I'm starting to establish those routines in the new place, right? So those are just things that I would keep in mind with that introduction yeah, process. Yeah, it does make me anxious because I feel like, <laughs> oh my God, is that going to lead to him? Of course. And, and you have to have that state of mind, right? It ha you, you have to be aware of it can turn into that for sure, right? But the growling in itself is not really a problem, right? It's, again, it's, it's almost a good thing that we could see that and we could be like, all right, what do I need to change right now? What am I doing incorrect that's making my dog feel uncomfortable right now? You know what I mean? Um, you know? Yeah. And then for the, we have two cats that are indoor yep. cats at that home. Mm -hmm. So they can kind of take care of themselves they sure. with the dog. With yep. So my gut would just be like to do the same thing and let the cats take care of themselves. Kind of, right? Actually, I wouldn't do a command for that um, just because those that's like a more real life situation of like we don't want to have to micromanage him with obedience like all the time. We need to teach what the expectation is, right? And cat stuff is pretty easy because I've talked about this before. It's, it's not ridiculously emotionally charged. It's just this kind of like biological instinct they have of like, pray, I chase you, right? Um, so, so that's really as, as simple as creating a boundary for the chasing. Right, so the second I, you know, let's say I bring him into the house, I have him loose, he sees the cat, he's like, boom, I'm going for the cat. That's just a, I hit the button at a high level, right? And I set that boundary of chasing the cats is not fun, right? Uh, and I stay consistent about that and monitor the situation for a couple of days, right? Giving them, you know, breaks, making sure the cats have somewhere they can go if they get uncomfortable, obviously, and making sure I have a place I can put him away from the cats if I'm not gonna be diligent about supervising it, obviously. And then you'll notice after a couple of days, they'll be cool with it, right? I, my wife has a cat and like when we first moved in with each other, it was the same deal. Like my dogs had never really been around cats before and same deal. It's like, oh, I, I chased this thing, <laughs> right? Uh, it's funny, I, uh, my, my one dog uh, actually chased him like up a tree one time the first time you met him. <laughs> was, same deal. I was like, I wasn't expecting it. And suddenly cats there, boom. Right? <laughs> so, so it was just a matter of, again, a couple days of consistently setting that boundary and they're, they're all, I mean, they, they don't even mind him now at this point. Yeah. Right. And same deal. He kind of sticks up for himself too. Like he's not too scared of them and he's not shy to give them a, a good swat if they get too annoying, you know? Yeah. So. I wonder about the one cat. He's a little more prone to mischief. Mis mis oh. Mis mis Water. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. It was like 140 pounds. <laughs> and he had no fear. Yeah. yeah, that's funny. Our, our cat is like that, man. He's, he's a little bit of a dick. So he's got his claws too. Like he'll, he'll sit there and like antagonize. He doesn't really do it much anymore because he's getting older now. But um, he used to like sit on a couch and like anytime the dogs would even walk by, like they wouldn't even do anything. They wouldn't even pay him any mind. He's just like, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like our one dog that got like so scared of him. Like it's funny, like she'd be in the hallway and if she knew the cat was like around the corner, she'd be like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. <laughs> 
But yeah, these uh, these long positions, like the long bed stays and the long down stays, these are really the best parts of these commands because they can help you like in a controlled way acclimate your dog to new things, right? Let's say I go to a new place, right? We're going to a new busy park or something like that. My dog's never been there and I think they might be a little overwhelmed by everything going on. I could just go park myself somewhere, put them into a down and just let them take it all in, you know, in a controlled way, right? And, you know, they're still aware of everything going on, but it's like we're splitting their brain a little bit and telling them like 50% of your brain needs to stay focused on this task at hand so that instead of having 100% of your brain freak out about everything going on, you only have half of it, right? So they can take it in a little bit more controlled, right? Uh, and then obviously I make sure in those settings, my level is motivating enough where then if they're too distracted by that, I can give a correction that's motivating enough to get them to refocus back in. Okay. Cause that's really where the magic happens with it is when they realize I'm still relevant, like as the owner, like you have to still pay attention to me. You gotta have one ear turned to me still with this. Yeah, it reminds me of like the, like at a certain point when you're a kid, you feel like your mom can see you. Sure. A hundred percent, right? And it helps influence your behavior, right? Where if you were free to just like figure all that stuff out with absolutely no direction or consequence, you know, it's like you're gonna get yourself into more trouble, right? Like you're not, you're not like mature and like mentally stable enough to be able to handle that kind of stuff. And dogs are the same way, right? They're kind of like children in that capacity. <laughs> Do you have any particular dogs that you're thinking about introducing him to? Yeah, my cousin who lives in the neighborhood and mm -hmm. she has two dogs. One is the same size as him and one is like a like six month old puppy mm -hmm. or four month baby. Yep. Um, mix. And <clears throat> I thought they might enjoy playing together. Sure. So Are those other two dogs pretty social? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. The one that's a little older, um, a little bit his size. Uh, yeah. He's a flat-coated retriever. Yep. And then what will be is he's a mix. He's a mix. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so so dog introductions is actually pretty simple. Um, and especially given that he really didn't have that many issues with other dogs, you know? Like the only time I noticed anything weird with him with another dog is there was another intact male we had here and like they were a little standoffish towards each other, but that's kind of normal, you know, when you have two uh, intact males, obviously. Uh, but again, it wasn't even really a problem. It's just they kind of like grumble at each other and stuff like that. And you know, no, 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 it wasn't like I'm trying to attack you or anything. It's just like, we're just kind of like playing tough guy, macho thing back and forth with each other, you know? Um, but we're actually getting him here tomorrow. Great. Oh, cool. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so I'm not super concerned about him with other dogs. And honestly, the process of introducing them, it's similar to the process of introducing to people, but I actually move through the stages quicker, right? So, so I have like an initial control, you know, side of things, same deal, right? So I wanna make sure I could get him to focus on me in the presence of this other dog, right? Just so I know again, I have one ear turned to me so that if, uh, if there are any problems, I could deescalate him pretty quickly, obviously, right? From there, I just kind of let them do their thing, right? Like I put them together and I don't do anything to mess with it. I'm not petting them. I'm not having them on a leash pulling up to the other dogs. I just drop my leash, let them go, let them sniff and, and figure each other out and stuff. And I just monitor it, you know? And I supervise and and uh, I, just, I just make sure that they kind of do their thing, you know? Dogs communicate in such a different way than people do, obviously, right? Like, like they understand each other more deeply than we understand them, right? So, so I can allow that stuff to kind of play out a little bit better and know that they probably know what they're doing with things, yeah. you know? So that would really be it. The only thing I would recommend is maybe uh, do it with one of the dogs at a time, you know? Let him develop a relationship with like one of the dogs, right? Let that go well, then do it with the other dog, then you could do it together. And then you just get into, you know, I, when it comes to socializing my dogs with dogs that don't live in the same household, I try to not have it be for crazy long periods of time, right? So a lot of people want to do that, like, oh, we're having a barbecue and everybody's bringing the dogs over. Or we're having a party and everybody's bringing the dogs over. I am not into that. I think that's recipe for disaster. Nine, yeah. Nine out of 10 times when people do that stuff frequently, it always at some point results in a dog fight. You know, just cause like it, any number of things can happen. Somebody drops a table scrap on the ground after five hours of the dogs being together and you know, he's getting cranky cause like he's just over it and like suddenly boom, like dog fight breaks out. That doesn't mean they're bad dogs, it just means that we didn't set up that scenario properly for them. Okay. We expected too much out of them and that, you know. So I usually recommend at least for a while, right? Just small play dates, right? 45 minutes to an hour, right? Let them have their fun, then just end it on a good note, you know, and let them, you know, develop the relationship that way. Okay. <laughs>
He's like, okay. <laughs> so now you can praise him or whatever if you want to. <laughs> cool. All right, I think that was good. So a uh, couple big takeaways here. One, you probably need to be working much higher on your e-collar for stuff, oh. right? If you're noticing he's blowing you off, if you're noticing he's getting too distracted by things, as long as you know you're being clear with things, which your timing looked pretty good with everything, your issue is probably a motivation issue, right? Um, second thing, the introduction to people and stuff, just following those three steps of control first, coexistence without people messing with him, then actual interaction um, will be kind of the sealed deal on that. And then I wanna see you guys get your crate stuff looking better and then the out of sight bed stays and stuff looking better. Yeah, yeah, great. Do you guys have any questions on that? This is, <coughs> this is probably dumb, but like. There's no dumb questions. And I know, I've, I've read your philosophy and obviously sure. brought it here. Is the, it's not harmful for him to use the e-collar, right? Mm -hmm. In the long term. Yeah. No. I mean, like, listen, you, you could get into reading all sorts of conflicting information here and there and this and that, right? Like, my dogs love me, right? Like, I use e-collars with them, right? But the e-collar allows me to do so many more things with them that I would never be able to do if I didn't have it. You know what I mean? So they're living a better, more fulfilled life because of that. Also, right, you get into in nature, right? There's consequences, right? If dogs are living out in the wild, animals out in the wild, they communicate with each other through consequence. They're not out there handing out cookies and giving each other rewards and stuff like that for things, right? And listen, yeah, we're uh, uh, more civilized than uh, uh, whatever, a pack of bears or, or something, you know what I mean? So, so we could get away with adding some more fun into it and, and doing things like that and stuff, but like this stuff is normal to them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like, forget an e-collar. Like you could say, well, we're not gonna use an e-collar, but we still have to be able to give them a consequence in some way, or else we have to just manage them forever, right? You get into the opposite philosophy of things, right? And you get into like kind of force-free training and stuff like that, which listen, if people wanna do that, I have no problem with that. If they're happy with the results that it gives them, right? It's gonna train the dog still. But the problem is there's a lot more managing and just avoiding problems, which just causes you to restrict your dog's life more. You know what I mean? And that's my problem with that kind of stuff. And that's why I choose to do this is because I want to do more things with them. I want to incorporate them into more parts of my life. Yeah. So. The reaction definitely was uh, pretty uh, less intense than, yeah. so. She settled down very quickly too, which was good. Mm -hmm. You'll continue to see that improve, you yeah. know? It's not, I always tell everybody, it's not like it's an off switch, you know? It's not just gonna shut down, oh, you know? It's yeah. gonna de-escalate over time is what you're gonna see. <clears throat> I've been trying to convince my friend to take her dog to train. Oh yeah? He's uh, a nutcase. A little crazy? Yeah. Nice. And she's just like, oh, he's just a rascal, it's fine. I'm like, yeah. well, you can probably make it a little <laughs> Definitely. Bit. Is this the little thing from Moana? Uh, no, it's just no. like a bark box toy. Oh, I thought it was that. I, yeah, I forgot what it's called. Was, but... uh, the weather, this type of weather <clears throat> gets frisky, so it's yeah. like toys out and play. Mm -hmm. Run around and squeak them. Nice. All right. Cool. Why don't you go ahead and release her? Do I need to just say that? Nah, I just thought her okay. Okay. And if you want to encourage her off, you can. Cool. And the next step here of the introduction process is just coexistence. So I'm not going to interact with her or anything. She's just going to be free, right? And uh, we'll see. She may just park herself next to you. Obviously, that's fine if she does. Uh, I would actually ignore her on your end because we want to see her kind of explore and stuff. Now, you said she's typically allowed on the furniture and stuff. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um, the problem is when we're dealing with dogs that have issues with people, right? The furniture is a very vulnerable place okay. for them to be in. So let's do this. Why don't you give her an off command? Down. Sophie, down. Now I would... <laughs> Knock it up. One second here. Oh. So, so two things, right? So one, I would switch from down to off because okay. down is going to be an obedience command, okay. right? So that can get confusing for her because she actually lay, she actually laid down right there when you told her down. We don't really have an off command because I don't ever need to use it. So, so that's going to be something we're going to start teaching here and establishing okay. today. So do you have your remote on you? Yeah. 
Cool, I'll take that from you. Oh, thank you. So what you're gonna do here is you're gonna tell her off one time. Don't okay. use any gestures or anything like that. If she doesn't do it, you're just gonna tell her no. Off. No. Then tell her off again. Off. Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> So I try to right off the rip, just establish clarity with it. I don't give a ton of help with my off because I want to know that she's just going to understand getting off out of that position, obviously, right? And this is how we're going to handle it with guests and stuff like that is since she is a lot on the furniture, typically whenever she wants, we just make sure when guests come over, we implement that off command one time. Okay. At that point, once we've told her off, we would just correct if she tried to go back on or if she didn't get off. Okay. And you could give help like that. The reason why I had you get up and walk away from it is because it's going to be easier. Maybe Maybe she would think when she got that correction to come, right, or yeah. something like that, which would help get her off of the furniture. But we do want to transition to if I'm sitting here and she's sitting here and I tell her off that she'll just get off. So you want to progressively get to that picture with it. And listen, if she wants to park herself in the crate, I have no problem with that, yeah. right? That's the key with this when you're at this stage of the training with the coexistence is they can go wherever they want to go, okay. right? And a lot of times we find that They'll try initially to put themselves in a vulnerable position, which is glued up right next to you, which is the yep. first thing we saw there. Then we give a correction for that, like, oh, this isn't an option. I'm just going to put myself somewhere else. Okay. I'm going to put myself away from all of the stuff going on, right? So we'll have her hang out there. All I'm going to do now is just start walking around a little bit here. Okay. And at this point, she's free. She can get out of the crate and stuff, right? Uh, I just don't want her... Um, reacting or acting aggressively or anything, obviously. And we'll determine what that looks like. You know, if she lets out a little growl or something, I'm not gonna be overly concerned about that. But if it's like full on reacting, we'll probably correct for it. <clears throat> and my job at this stage of this is just ignore her also, right? It's yeah. Strict instruction with gas, just leave her be. Cool, this looks good. Um, so this is obviously step two when you have gas come over is just neutrality with it. And you're still not even gonna worry about pushing the interactions and stuff. So <clears throat> let the doorbell ring or yep. if, if they're walking in with me and I'm mm -hmm. taking her out of the crate would be my next question. Yes. Yeah, so, well, so are you, so, like, hang on. We went out, left the house. And I understand. Coming back. Yeah. So um, you would get her out of the crate probably with a leash or something and still okay. just put her right into position for a minute All right. and let her kind of deescalate cool. and chill out there. And then give her the free command. Yep. Let her. Mm -hmm. And at that point, just no furniture access. We just use our off if she tries to get up. And then third step would be interaction, but only if the dog wants it. So for example, Sophie, come here. I could try to call her over to me. Good job, right? And interact at that point. And if she comes to me, I could interact. If not, no big deal. Just leave it be. Just leave okay. her be. Sophie, come here. Good job. Good job. Sophie. Good. She's super shaky. Yeah. Sophie. Good. Sophie. <clears throat> good job. It's pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Not too shabby. It's almost like she compartmentalized a little bit and was like, okay, yeah. I can skip this step. Yeah, I mean, again, like Still we stressed, but. worked through a lot of the nonsense. We created some, you know, boundaries and stuff mm -hmm. for things. Got her into a little bit better of a state of mind. Good job. Sophie, come. Good. Okay. Sophie, come. Good. Okay. Sophie, come. Good. Okay. Sophie, come. Good job. Okay. Yeah, she looks really good. 
I think she did super well. A um, couple things here. So one, obviously we moved into the next progression, which is having her free. Um, we gotta work on that off command a little bit, obviously. Start establishing that with her. That'll be beneficial. But outside of that, interactions and stuff were fine. I mean, that, that worked really, really well. So yes. I'm, I'm pleased with that. Um, Me too. With your walking, a little bit more clarity to where you want Honor. her to be, okay. obviously, and have that clear distinction of like, we're either in this position or you're not in this position. Exactly. And then using your no to uh, correct for that. And then the last part is with the no marker, obviously if you say no, you always have to follow up with a correction, yep. right? Or else it loses its value and it stops working, right? So if I say no and then realize like two seconds later, still correct. Yep. Okay. That's the cool thing about the no markers. It buys you that latency because I always okay. say like, there's going to be times that remote's not in your hand, yeah. right? Like, and let's say my remote's in my kitchen, right? And I'm hanging out in the living room and my dog starts freaking out at something, right? I can tell them no. And even if they stop right there, I can walk all the way into the kitchen, get, get my remote, it. give my correction. And they know that that's for whatever they were doing when they heard no. Cool. Right? Got it. And that way, as long as your collar's on or you have your thing to correct your dog, you'll never run into a situation where you're like, oh, I got caught off guard and couldn't do anything about yeah. it. Like you always have the ability have to, the ability, you know, yeah. as long as you're consistent about always giving that correction after. Makes sense. So that's a big one because that really helps people like feel like, because, you know, otherwise you get stuck where it's like, this thing needs to be in my hand at all times, yeah. which isn't the case. Like if I go for walks, mine's usually in my pocket or something, yeah. you know, or right. we, my wife and I keep them in like a central location in the house somewhere where we know where it is. We go grab it if we need to, yeah. you know, so. But she looks great. You have any questions on that? No. Nope. Good work, so Good work. <laughs> this actually looks really good. I'm impressed. Especially since we didn't finish everything off. This looks really good. Yeah, so he's having a bit of a hard time staying. Sure. But kind of. It looks pretty good, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of rad. Like yesterday, she uh, oh, we yeah. had someone over and they holding the door <laughs> the open. bolting episode. Yeah, yeah, Bolted out the door. Mm -hmm. And she didn't come when I called her, but then Deanna had the buzzer. Did she come back once you corrected her? Yeah. Perfect. No, so. She was probably about 50 yards away. Was, yeah, yeah. She was in other people. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, typically, like, at the end of the session and stuff, we sit down, we kind of go over, you know, best practices as far as transitioning because it's very normal that they're going to push your buttons initially. You know, it's very normal coming back into the house that you're going to have issues with things and see hiccups and stuff like that. So, um, again, normally would have kind of prepped you for that a little bit more, obviously, but that's why we're here today. So. Um, so, so obviously we're going to finish everything we didn't get to last time, but past that, since we're, this is kind of now like a quasi finishing send home slash follow up session, what have you noticed in the last couple days? Um, when we were trying to, you know, we've tried to walk, them. you had a good successful walk. Oh, after I watched your videos, mm -hmm. yeah, I, um, I took them each separately and they did well. Sonny is very distracted here. Like, okay. He's, we'll take a look at that. Yeah, yeah. he's not paying. He's looking for triggers. He's not paying attention to me <laughs> sure. at all. She did great. Yeah, cool. Um, and then, so I took them each individually, and then I took them together. Mm -hmm. They both did, like, pretty well. So yep. he still was, like, sure. you know, she would sit down and, like, look at me or walk by me and look at me. He was just, like, yeah, I got you. oh, I'm getting zapped. Okay. He was pulling. Yeah. He was pulling. Like, yeah, we'll get that under control today. A lot of that typically has to do with either... Uh, improper timing with your correction or improper level with your correction. It's always going to be one of those two things. So we'll take a look at which of those that it is. Yeah, and I want to talk about this thing too because <clears throat> I've like accidentally zapped them a couple of times, like trying to go back and forth to change the number. And I, feel I gotcha. So bad. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I've been there. I've done that once or twice. So yeah, as far as changing the level is concerned, so do you have it set where both of them are on the same number or have you been locking them in? I was trying to lock them in. Okay. And then so it's like once it's locked, sure. unless you, yeah. as far as I can tell, unless you unlock the one you're on, mm -hmm. turn it to zero and then go to, like, I can't figure yeah, out how to. Yeah, I'll show you how to do it. Okay. So typically speaking, I actually don't recommend locking the levels in initially. Yeah. Um, because it's such a pain in the ass to then go in and like unlock it and change the level and this and that. Like all of my dogs are typically on, like they sell a four dog system, but I have like two two dog systems mm -hmm. for them. And usually what I'll do is I'll keep it unlocked, which means that whatever number it's set at is the number for both of them. Right. And then I'll just toggle up and down as I need to, depending okay. on which dog I need to correct That's for something, kind of you know? I started doing just because I didn't want to yeah. accidentally you'll, hit them. You'll also find that you could do a couple other things. One is, keep your level set kind of in between 
both of them, you know? So you're maybe like overcorrecting just a little bit Sunny and undercorrecting Kaya just a little bit, but like it'll kind of balance out fine. Okay. And then long term, once you get past this first week with them and like things are kind of on track with stuff, then you kind of just keep it set at whichever dog is the problem dog, Okay. <laughs> you know? So if you're finding that Kaya is doing great on her walks, but Sunny's having a hard time with it, mm -hmm. you can keep the level set for Sunny. And then if you need to correct Kaya for something, then you just adjust it real quick and then okay. give the correction from there. And I found that that's way easier as far as handling okay. that. Okay. So again, we'll get into all of that too. Uh, so walking, obviously distractions with him. We'll get that under control today. Anything else that you've noticed? Um, <clears throat> so he is doing the thing and I, like, I wanted to get your opinion on the best way to address it, mm -hmm. but he's doing like, I guess the jealousy thing. Like I call Kaya and he comes and like, oh, and sure. we did that too. We were doing like comes and mm -hmm. she was coming to me and then he just like railroaded her. So she went like over there, sure. you know? Um, so yeah, cause I know you were saying, you know, you do your dogs at home kind of as a, everybody's doing this, yeah. everybody's doing that. Yep. But sometimes I would like for one of them to stay where they are and the other one to, you know, mm -hmm. come over or whatever, or him just not. Yeah, I think I always try to look at like, what's the actual issue we're trying to address? And it sounds like the reason for you wanting to do it that way would be so that he's not like bullying her out yes. of the way, right? Yeah. Like that's really where it's important because I've never run into a situation with my dogs where I've been like, I need one of them to do this while the other does this kind of thing. Right. If anything, what it usually is, is like all of them are free and I need one of them to do something and I ask that one to do it and then I don't really care if the others do it. Okay. If they do, it's fine. If they don't, it's fine also, like I, you know? I kind of wonder now if you called Kaya whether Sonny would he probably would, you know? And and I also get into like early on in the training process, like they really haven't been training that long. Like five weeks isn't that long in the grand scheme of things. Like that's kind of unfair if we're like, we're gonna give a deliberate come command, you know what I mean? And he's so used to now like, oh, come means oh, I do this, right. right? And then he does it thinking he's doing the correct thing. And we're like, no, that's wrong, yeah. right? Again, later on, it's not that okay. you can't teach those things. Like you okay. could, okay. it's just one of those things where it's like, do you need to, right? I always look at like, what fights do I need to fight and which ones can I just be like, this doesn't really matter that yeah. much. And like I said, I've, I've never run into a scenario where it's like impacted me with my dogs that I couldn't get one of them to do things okay. versus the other, you know? Yeah, I guess it's more just like Sunny's like, oh, somebody's petting Kaya, I need sure. to get in between them. Yeah, and that's a different- <laughs> Called Kaya, I need to go over there. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And, and that's a different story. We'll get into how to address those types of things. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna do here is, um, I'll take Sonny from you there. Okay. Thank you. And I'm gonna take the remote from you. Oh, yeah. And don't worry too much about what she's doing while I'm walking him, just because you're not gonna be able to enforce right. it, obviously. Okay. Um, we'll just start with him, then I'll do it with her, and then we'll kind of get into all that. So we'll get him to the street here first, and then we'll go over what to do. <clears throat> All right, so if you remember at the facility when we were working with the food and stuff like that, we were doing the come command and getting them to follow us around, right? So the walk is exactly the same as that. We're using the same command for it, right? The only thing that changes is the psychology of how we go into it because they have a leash on, right? And naturally our inclination is to shorten this leash up and try to kind of joystick them around with it. And I always say, if you try to do that, you're gonna make them wanna go forward more because anytime you're applying tension, that makes them wanna dig into it, typically speaking. So I make sure I go completely loose on my leash here. We're gonna give our come command, we'll start walking, and at that point, if he gets out of position, meaning his attention is gone, right, he's moving off this way, moving off this way, all I'm gonna do is tell him no, give a correction on the e-collar, then repeat my come command, and what I wanna see is him fix himself, so I shouldn't need to pull him back into position. He should slow down and wait for me then at that point. So what I'll do is I'm gonna start walking this way. I'll have you guys stay maybe like 15, 20 feet behind me just so he doesn't get confused. We'll see what we get. Sonny, come. No. Sonny, come. <clears throat> so right away at the beginning, obviously one correction as he tried to dart ahead. That was at about a 20 that I corrected at there. And obviously he's matching my pace now. So we'll see what we get here. So much better. And as soon as I got the message from you guys, like it's quick fixes usually, it's just hard to explain without showing you, you know? <clears throat> 
Now, as far as positioning, I don't get super crazy with like heel being super strict right here or anything. The walk to me is more about maintaining my dog's attention on me. So you see in his case, he's kind of like center of the body in line with my leg. No, come. Right there, obviously I lost his attention, but as long as he's matching my pace like that, that's all that I care about. Then obviously at this point, he's kind of in the groove here. So it looks pretty good. Good job, buddy. Good job. Okay. Oh, All right. So much better than he was today. <laughs> so let's do this. Um, let's switch real quick. I'll give you him. I'll take her. Same deal. Don't worry about what he's doing when you're walking him right now. Kaya, come. No. Come. Now in her case, she works a little higher. That was about a 45 there that I had to give a correction. And then same deal, you see she's now nice and in the groove there. So from there, I'll take both of them. So I'll take this leash. <clears throat> Come. Sunny, no. Come. There we go. Get your leashes all untangled and then you're good to go. And again, just kind of holding those handles. The leashes are really just for safety purposes. That's it. They shouldn't be actually doing anything though. And we're not seeing a whole lot of it right now, but one other note with this is I don't care too much about lagging behind. Like I'm not gonna really nitpick that too much. If you notice it like you did right there, you could give just a little encouragement up like you did. It's really more so just that front perimeter. You wanna make sure they're not getting out of range there. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't zap them on that one. Yep. No, they, yeah, that was correct. So when do you let them uh, pee and stuff? Your, your call, you know, I try to structure my walk out into three kind of segments where I'll start with some healing like this because I like to start on a nice strict note, you know, make sure we're setting the tone of the walk. Somewhere in the middle, I'll pick a spot, release them with okay, let them sniff around, go to the bathroom, whatever, you know, and at that point, you guys are free to do whatever. Uh, and then I'll end with healing again to make sure I could focus them back in. Okay. And you can structure it and make those segments as long or as short as you want to. Like in my case, there's kind of a park around the corner from our house that we'll walk the dogs to okay. and we'll heal them there and then once we get to the park it's kind of like we'll let them off leash and run around and stuff and then we'll heal them back home um, some people have like on their route just like a quick little spot that's like the potty spot you know and they just release them there real quick and then are right back into the healing um, so you could structure that out however you guys uh, deem fit come good okay come Good. Okay. Come. Good. Okay. Come. Good job. Okay. Like I said, the walk seemed great. I mean, they really did good with that. That's just gonna be a matter of just holding them to that standard of what we want them to do, obviously, okay. you know, and just being consistent about enforcing that boundary. And I usually say, like we were talking about how we, you know, we'll structure out the walk sometimes and do like the three stages of it and stuff like that. Um, initially, like first couple of weeks, I try to err more on the side of more healing than more freedom, obviously, because that's really what you're gonna struggle with, with any, if anything, you know? Um, from there, once that's good, that's when you can kind of give them a little bit more freedom with it and stuff like that. But you want to make sure you've gained control in this environment around most of your distractions, you know? So the majority of your walks are going to be healing for right now, obviously. Um, again, you know, squirrels, cats, birds, whatever, any of those things that would typically get them distracted, um, just make sure your level's high enough for it, obviously, you know, and play around with that, you know, 
can and see, you know, how high do we need to go? How low do we need to go, et cetera, et cetera. Um, staying loose on your leashes, big part of it, obviously. That's, that's probably the biggest part of it. Cause again, the second you start shortening those up and putting that tension on, everything kind of goes out the window, you know? Uh, passing people, passing dogs, just create some distance as you go around, make sure they're not trying to sniff over or anything. Okay. Um, basically, you just gotta look at everything as a distraction, right? And, and we're trying to get you to do this. So if you're doing anything other than this, it's cause you're just distracted by those things, right. you know? What about like when we're walking and um, someone else with another dog, mm -hmm. they wanna let the dog say hi? We don't do on-leash greetings. So on-leash greetings is like the single worst place you could socialize your dog. Because you figure, one, a lot of dogs typically have a lot of arousal issues on the walk to begin with. So you're going into this social with them already like amped up, you know? Two, like, you know, dogs need to always feel like they have an ability to give themselves space or flee if they're uncomfortable. And if they're on a leash, even if they technically can move five feet away, they're trapped in their mind. Yeah. So they're 10 times more likely to react in that situation if they get uncomfortable, okay. setting you back. And then three, let's say they like it. Let's say they want to meet the other dog like Kai and Sunny do, mm -hmm. right? Then you're kind of patterning in when you see people or you see dogs get excited and get overstimulated because there's a chance you're going to say hi, which the whole thing you guys contacted me about was you have issues with them getting too distracted by those in the walk. So you're kind of fighting an uphill battle with it, okay. right? So it's just a very unnatural way of socializing your dog. I always make sure if I'm going to socialize my dog, one, it's with dogs that I know and trust, and two, it's in an area where they could be free to move around and like express themselves naturally. Because especially with these two, well, like they play rough, yeah. right? They jump and run and this and that. Then you get into, let's say they're trying to play on leash, then they start feeling that leash every four seconds because they're trying to do that that's going to create even more frustration which again makes it more likely for them to have these frustrated responses of like reacting and stuff okay. so it's just it's just typically a bad idea you know i just say hey, listen sorry we're training right now you know yeah. like i said if you got a neighbor or something like that that you want to introduce them to and you want to do it in somebody's yard or something like that that's a different story you know uh, but on the walk is in my opinion never the place for socialization so as far as like <clears throat> introducing them then yep. <clears throat> with like friends, dogs or mm -hmm. whatever, we had actually started doing this thing where we just take them on a walk in a neutral place sure. together first mm -hmm. and then kind of let them go. Um, and it seems so far to have been working, but mm -hmm. you're saying that's not necessarily... Well, no, that's actually, there's nothing wrong with that because what you're doing is like when you take them for the walk, you're basically just gaining control around each other. You know what I mean? So as long as they're not interacting while they're on the walk and they're just going for a walk and it's like, yeah. you're here, I'm here, I'm focused on mom, you know, you know, whatever. Uh, that's perfectly fine. I have no problem with okay. it. Um, I don't know if going for the walk together really does a whole, you know, I think a lot of people look at it like, oh, they're getting well, used to each other. My yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so for that purpose, if it helps you and it makes you feel more comfortable, I have absolutely no problem with it. It's not going to hurt anything by any means. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times my first thing I do when I introduce, um, my dogs to another dog is I gain control around that dog first, whether that's with a down stay, whether that's with a bed stay, leash walking, something like that, where I can make sure I've got your attention on me before we meet this dog right here, okay. as opposed to them just being like, oh my God, there's a dog and I can't focus, yeah. you know? So, so there's no problem with that. And then from there, you know, if you're doing it at a park, excuse me, um, and you know, you have an area where then you could let them off leash to run around and play, again, no problem with that. You just gotta obviously trust that, you know, your dogs are gonna be reliable in that area right. and stuff. So, okay. so yeah, there's there's nothing wrong with that. So what would be the ideal if we had a friend come over with a mm -hmm. dog and we go over to someone's house? Yep. Um, you want to be somewhere where there's not going to be a ton of places where a dog can get cornered. So, you know, your living room is fairly open, so that's not really a, a huge problem. Yeah. You know, we see some people just have these really tiny little living rooms with all these little corners and stuff they can get trapped in, and that's just typically not a good idea, you know? So something like this, though, you know, you would have them come in, other dog would be on a leash, your guys would be either on a leash or in a downstay or something like that, and then just relax for a minute, you know? Let everybody just kind of hang out. Nobody's interacting or anything yet. Just let the energy come down, you know? Let them kind of get used to seeing the other dogs, the other dog get used to seeing them and, and let it simmer down a little bit. From there, once everybody's kind of chilled out a little bit, you release all the dogs and you just supervise, okay. you know? Okay. Um, and then you make
make sure obviously that you remove the three things dogs would typically fight over, which are food, toys, affection, right? Affection being the biggest one. Most people make the mistake of if they're, you know, we have dogs here hanging out and stuff, mm -hmm. they're petting the dogs and constantly interacting with yeah. them and stuff. And all you're doing is just in their mind, turning yourself into a resource, which makes them again, 10 times more likely to then react aggressively in those situations, okay. you know? So I just yeah. completely ignore the dogs and I just supervise it and I play lifeguard and that's it. You know? Okay, so before we had Kaya, I had Sunny over at a friend's house mm -hmm. who has a, a um, big labradoodle. Mm -hmm. And they were. Uh, he was over here. Oh, yeah, also happened over there, though. Oh, did it? Yeah. Oh, okay. And, uh, and they were playing. <clears throat> they seemed to be playing, you know, like feeling each other out. Sure. Playing fine. And then, but, you know, af after about 15 minutes or so. Oh, wow, yeah. The, the 20 minutes, I don't know, the playing just got more and more kind of intense. Until sure. Until it got, until it turned into a fight. Until sure. it turned into a fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. And when that was happening, you guys weren't, you were just watching it and it just kept boiling up? Or were you guys doing anything, do you know? We had walked inside and then I think heard the yelling, like, because uh, the other I got two you. were still out here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, you get into like how this stuff can like just boil over so quickly, right? So, so uh, giving you a direct example of it, so like my dogs, right? The first fight they got into with each other like three years ago was a situation almost exactly like that, right? They were kind of getting to know each other, right? They were playing, right? They were playing super rough with each other and it kind of just kept boiling over, boiling over and same deal. Like I was out of town, my wife's watching it and then suddenly it just, it just like that just turned into a dog fight. You know what I mean? Um, so, so I go into those situations to prevent that kind of stuff, not stopping it necessarily because like they need to figure each other out, right? I need to let them play with each other to kind of like learn how far they can go with things. But I'm going to be very in tune with the energy in that moment. And I'm going to be prepared to shut it down like that if I need to, right? So usually if I'm socializing any dog that has a history of having problems with other dogs, I just keep my e-collar set all the way up for that as like the emergency break. And I'll just sit there and I'll just watch it, right? And I'll see it escalate and I'll see it escalate and I'll see it escalate and as soon as it hits that point where i'm like this is just way too much i just give a correction right away for that right so what about and then like you separate them or just the correction should do that on its own right okay. if i give a correction first off you correct sunny, sunny on 100 like he's gonna be like whoa what the fuck yeah. you know <laughs> and, and go do something else right um you shouldn't need to step in and intervene at that point because it should just bring it down a couple notches, right? I'm not saying you guys can't play with each other. Yeah. I'm just saying you guys got to just take a chill pill. So you know what I mean? The other dog. The other dog's yeah, because <clears throat> if only one's getting the correct, yeah. what if like, one stops with the other? It, it, you know, you have to know the dogs you're socializing with because here's the thing, right? Really, we're going into this more concerned about Sunny than we are the other dog, probably, mm -hmm. right? And if we're concerned about both of them, like if, if the other person is like, hey, like my dog has a history of issues also, I would just never put those dogs together in the first place, okay. you know? Two dogs that are questionable, it's like recipe for disaster, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, so, so really in that moment, he would be the problematic one more than anything, and if we stopped him, nine out of 10 times the other dog will kind of chill out for a minute also and just kind of go do something else. And then what you'll probably see is in a couple minutes, they go back and they start sniffing each other again. And then it kind of, you know, more more moderately kind of picks itself back up again, but it doesn't hit that like level 10, yeah. you know, excitement with things. So now like hopefully we get them to the point where we don't ever have to go to a dog park. <laughs> but sure. if we do. Wait, say that again, sorry. Um, so we're, like, hopefully we can just have them off leash. Like when we're traveling and oh, I understand. Have to I understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. If we do, and there's other dogs yep. there. Um, so we would just. Well, same, yeah. so here's the thing, right? Dog parks are always a bad idea because like we were just talking, like I would never put him with a certain type of dog, right? right? Um, we want to introduce our dogs in a certain way. We need to make sure we're setting up the environment properly with no uh, food, no toys, no affection. As soon as you step into a dog park with other owners, you relinquish all control of that stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and nine out of 10 times, there's somebody in the dog park throwing a ball for their dog, which is a big no-no, right? Yeah. Nine out of 10 times, there's somebody there giving their dog a bunch of treats, which is a big no-no. No, no. Nine out of ten times, the every there's the person in there that every time a new dog comes in, they're like, "Oh, puppy, hey, blah, blah, blah. 
up, which is a big no-no, okay. you know? So okay. it's just like you're setting yourself and your dog up for failure, right? So so I avoid them like the plague. It's a different story if you go somewhere that has a dog park and there's nobody there and you're just gonna use it to let your dogs yeah. go to the bathroom. And if you see somebody coming up, you're like, hey, I'm just gonna leave now. Yeah. That's a different story. I have no problem with that, obviously. Um, but going there when there's other dogs socializing, it's just, you don't have control over it. It's not worth it, you know? It's like, she does great at dog park because I'm just like, oh, thank God there's other dogs yeah. that run you. And Sure. Yeah, and the thing is, like, every dog's a little bit different, right? Like, I have plenty of clients that I have this conversation with them, and they still take their dogs to dog parks. Yeah. And it's like, whatever, you know? Like, if you have a good, easy, stable dog, like, the chances of there being a problem are way less, obviously. Yeah. But, like, they're not eliminated altogether. Like, the risk is still there, yeah. you know? Um, but, it's you know, it becomes less of a problem the more stable your dog is, right? But, like, if you have a dog that even remotely is, like, special needs with socialization and stuff, yeah. it's just not it's just not worth it in my opinion you know and you know i'm sure you guys could very easily get them to a place where you just let them run off leash and yeah. stuff where it's not going to be an issue right. you know the they're very responsive with stuff i would try to perfect it out here first which they look really good with obviously and then just take it to a local park and just use long lines initially you know just make sure that recall is like bomb proof okay. you know <clears throat> then you get into obviously when i do have my dogs off leash i'm just way more on top of them over stuff. You know, I keep my e-car set way higher. Like if, if I'm off leash in an area where there's other people and dogs, mm -hmm. not directly around, but like that they could possibly see and go for, I keep my e-car set like double what I would normally have it set at. You know, I'm, I'm just really, really in tune with that stuff, okay. you know, to try to avoid problems with it. So, so that's the biggest thing with that kind of stuff. So, and it, uh, we're still going to do, we'll still do a follow-up session next week, obviously. And I do want to go over like socialization and stuff in that one with okay. you guys. We'll, we'll really get into that stuff so you guys can kind of see how we do it. Um, but, but for right now, that's, those are the things I would focus on, you know, be aware of. Okay. So. so really then this week, just keep doing everything. That yeah, it's really this week. The big thing is going to be just isolating all of those core commands, right? Again, you guys are now. We're, this is actually kind of working out nice that we're able to do it this way because we were able to see a little bit more. And since they've had a couple, you guys have had a couple of days of working with them, we're able to fine tune a couple of things already, yeah. you know? But the beds, they look great with me coming. That really looked awesome. Okay. So I would keep pushing that, obviously. I would get your come command looking bomb proof out here. Don't worry about working it too much in the house. I try to kind of separate where and when I work commands to make it easier for the dogs, right? Like inside of the house, nine out of 10 times, if you need to do a command, it's gonna be a bed stay. You know what I mean? So don't worry about too much else aside from that. It's not wrong to do like downstairs and stuff in the house, but it's like, that's the one you need. So let's get that one just really good in there. Okay. You know, out here, come command, right? It's gonna be nine out of 10 times what you're gonna need, right? So let's get that one really good out here. And then obviously out on your walk is, is where you'd practice your walking and stuff, you know? So, so focus those things primarily. Um, start, you know, working a little higher on your levels around distractions and stuff, you know? Um, and yeah, see if you can get that stuff just looking really good. Okay. Is there any other big issues like, or problematic behaviors you guys have in the past noticed at the house or you've noticed in the last couple of days here? Uh, not really. Like with Sonny, I think his biggest thing is the fear, like the fear-based. Yeah reaction mm -hmm. um but yeah i know even like the di like where that orange yep pipe is back there's a chipmunk hole right there <laughs> nice <one> there. <laughs> <laughs> and before they came to you guys there was like three massive holes right there. Like, i filled them all in and the first place he went was yeah. over there like dig in you know, he stuck his nose in and started to do this, and I just told him to leave it. And yeah, yeah. I did that twice, and I haven't seen him go back over there. Good. So, but yeah, really, it's digging and, like, getting into this flower <laughs> Yep. Now, one thing to what you just said. So you said you told him leave it, obviously, which well, I'm glad he left it, obviously, and he hasn't done it. I don't use leave it for those types of things. Leave it or drop or off or any of those kinds of like interrupter commands are reserved for things that the dog is sometimes allowed to do, right? Okay. Where it's like, okay, cool. Like, like, let's say there's a toy on the ground right here that nine out of 10 times he's allowed to play, but right now I want him to leave it for whatever reason. Okay. That's where I would use that command, right? Okay. Something like that, I never want him digging holes in the backyard, right? Probably never want him going in that flower bed right there. So I just set boundaries and corrections for those things. Okay. So I'm just going to give a correction right when he does it to tell him like, this is something that next time you think about doing, you shouldn't do at all. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so keep that in mind when you're, you know, asking behaviors and stuff is okay. if you never want him to do it, just give a correction for it. Okay. So, 
So most of the correct, most of the commands inside will just be bad. Yeah, I mean, it's not, like we talked about last time when we were working all those like commands and stuff and doing the comms and this and that, you could still definitely do those things, right? But with those things, that's gonna be really just with the food, okay. you know? Um, but at this point, this is where, you know, after the first week in the follow-up session, we typically transition to what we're doing right now. So again, we're, we're a little ahead of the game right now, okay. you know? Um, but this is where we get into just real functional training. You know what I mean? We don't need to be having fancy this and that, right? We just need like, this is where I need this and this is where I don't need this, you know? So try to focus on that kind of stuff primarily.